We thought we had started to sense we had something special at E3 in 2006 when we showed it. And we had never shown it really to people before and there's just a very strong reaction from the journalists. And we won a bunch of Game of Show awards and stuff. But at that point we thought, well, these are the System Shock fans and they just, they want, you know, that's still a pretty niche audience, you know. And I think that we thought that it was a weird game. Um, you know, it's about an underwater objectivist utopia, you know. It's not exactly something that, you know, some you know, college kid's gonna pitch to another college kid. And, you know, you, you don't picture, like, the captain of the football team pitching that to, to some other guy. But what's great about gamers, it turns out, yes, the captain of the football team was pitching it, you know, to his friend. And I think I underestimated gamers. We sell 5 million copies. I mean, how many people does that, how many people have played it? You know, you sort of do the math, it's probably order 15, 20 million. It's a lot of people. Um, and I think that's, that's exciting that something as, niche seeming and as odd as Bioshock could be so broadly appealing because it says that, you know, you can have weird stuff. I mean, look at a movie like Inception. It's, it's weird, right? It's not like what you think is a huge hit. It's, you know, about, it's very talky. It's relatively slow paced. There's not a huge, tons of huge action sequences. It's very sort of cerebral in, in, a lot, in a lot of ways compared to certainly to Bugs, Big Summer Blockbusters. And yet it was a huge hit because the audience wants a good story and the audience wants to be challenged. I think that was surprising and exciting, but you know, I thought if we had sold a million units, I would have been over the moon. Um, and that was my personal goal. Like, oh, I want to sell a million units of something. Um, and it just kept selling and selling and selling. And we were just, we were again, as stunned as anybody else. What was amazing about the first day of working on Bioshock Infinite is we sort of called the, the old, um, you know, a lot of the sort of senior members into a room and said, well, we've been working on this prototype of something and we're not very happy with it. It's not really working, this other game we were working on. And we said, well, what, what should we do? And somebody said, well, what about another Bioshock game? And we all sort of rolled our eyes and said, well, you know, we've already decided not to do that. You know, we're thinking about what, what do we want to do after Bioshock and uh, Steven Alexander, our effects artist, floated the idea that we don't necessarily need to stay within Rapture to do the next game. Um, and we said, well, but you know, it's in Bioshock Rapture. And the more we thought about it, the more we realized it wasn't Rapture. You know, the same way that, you know, System Shock has some, you know, ties to Bioshock. And those are nothing, you know, there's no showdown in Bioshock. And we, the more we talked about it, the more we realized it was about this sort of narrative mission we were on. And it was about sort of player-driven, um, you know, combat and about, this sort of world and characters that the player felt they had they could really be integrated with. And then everything else, once you realize everything else was secondary, we sort of said, well, what about turn of the century? And everybody's like, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, we started reading on the history, like a lot of us here are history buffs, so we like to go to the source. What's happening during this time period? What's, what's going on? What's going to get our creative juices flowing? And then we sort of looked, we sort of went on the internet and looked at pieces of art, um, like science fiction art from the time. We kept seeing floating cities, floating cities, floating cities. Um, these very fantastical floating cities. That seemed to be a, a meme at the time and in, in science fiction. And um, we all tuned into that right away. It wasn't necessarily like we start with Booker and Elizabeth and, and here's what we're gonna do. We start with an idea and a place and a, and a time that really gets us excited. And what's going on in that time period? What, what's going on with the technology? What are the the memes of the day, and then that starts coalescing into a story. That was the last day I think that we decided upon something and stuck with it for the entire game. <laughs> you know, like that was we had these two major concepts, and we never had another day like that. And when we first started uh, making attempts at what does Columbia look like, um, we were going back to the same color palette and the same like dark and stormy and really kind of claustrophobic spaces that we were building in Rapture. It was much more like Bioshock 1, like these sort of tighter corridors and you catch an occasional glimpse of sky. It was very, the, the color palette was very dark and muted and, and full of um, greens and, and oranges and purples and you know, the two of very Bioshock 1 colors. You know, early tests had cloud cover like really pushed in. So even though you're outside, it really felt like an interior space because it was, the storm clouds are pushing you in and there's lightning flashes and the light is like dark blue, dark green. And you know, you, you take a step back from that and you realize oh, we're just building Rapture again. You know, we're putting another uh, spin on it that yeah, those are clouds instead of water. 
that we're really not pushing this idea far enough. Like if you're in the sky, like let's make it in the sky. Let's 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 take the clouds away. Let's have this bright sunny daylight. Let's just do the polar opposite of what we're doing in Rapture and see where that leads us. It, and we just kept evolving and evolving and evolving it. And we kept throwing away, sort of moving away from our comfort zone, moving our way. You know, then one day I was like, I was, um, you know, well, what if it was, you know, what if you were with somebody? What if you weren't silent, you know? And then it's like, she's mute. What if she, well, she, well, you know, we made her a mute figure because that was close to her comfort zone. And then we said, well, what if she wasn't mute? What if you weren't mute? What if, um, what if the color palette was something completely different than Bioshock 1? What the feel, the airy, it was felt airy and open. And how will we achieve feelings of dread and, 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 and tension in that space? And, you know, um, I remember really struggling with the visual, all of us struggling with the visual. And I went for a run one day and it was like in June. And um, it was one of those beautiful, beautiful, like New England summer days that are just gorgeous. And the sun's coming down, the sky is completely blue and the flowers are out and the way the light is completely saturating them. And, you know, the, the colors are beautiful. And I remember looking at this mailbox and seeing the sun play along the mailbox. Like, you know, the metal top of the black, this black mailbox. And I actually took out my iPhone, I was on a run, and I filmed the, the play of the light on the mailbox, which is, you know, weird and nerdy, but I did. And I'm sure if the owners of the house saw me, you know, they probably would have come out with a shotgun. But it reminded me of being a kid and being at like July 4th picnics and things like that, which are, you know, our, our sort of summertime celebration. And it brought me back to a memory. And then I started thinking about Columbia as America, not as it ever really was, but as sort of politicians remember it to be in their heads or think it was. And this ideal vision of, you know, blue skies and puffy clouds and, and, and hummingbirds and bees buzzing and the, tree, and the flowers so saturated the light, that, you know, that powerful sunlight um, sort of all came together and I came in the next day and I was just like, you know, it's, fourth of, it's the ideal 4th of July picnic. That's what the city looks like. And we just, everybody sort of, okay, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense. And we sort of started working from there. We were comfortable at the end of Bioshock 1 because we made Rapture and it took a few years to get to that point. But then throwing it all away, that's where you start, you know, okay, okay, we're, we're ready to start something new and explore what this space is and learn about what Columbia is going to be, what Elizabeth is going to be, what the game systems are going to be, because we, you know, we, we want to push beyond just doing another game about Rapture. The best way to learn, I think, is, is, is by failing. Um, I think we're a company that's not afraid to fail, and it's just try it, see if it works, and if it doesn't, now you know what not to do. We set a very high bar with System Shock 2, and then there were, the bar was raised for Bioshock 1, and now we're raising it again uh, for Bioshock Infinite. I think if, you, if you're not afraid, of failing, then you become complacent and you tend to not take risks at all and, and you just do what's safe and what's safe isn't interesting to us. Something that scares us to death, that's what we want to work on. If we have a mission, it's to advance, it's to figure out how to integrate gameplay and narrative so it's one consistent experience and to make the player a participant in the narrative, not an observer. And if we have a sort of working process it's when we get comfortable, we always go, wait a minute, are, why are we so comfortable here? Yeah, I don't think I've ever been comfortable a day of work at Irrational. Um, I mean, this studio is definitely, you know, I almost feel like if I, if I come to work and I'm comfortable and confident uh, that what we're doing is going to be successful, then it, it feels weird, like what's going on, what am I doing wrong? We demand excellence of one another, um, and that's, a hard thing to do and it, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort and that's not that's not for every game developer like that's you know that's not the working formula in a lot of studios and I think that could be you know that can be shocking for some people that it is as experimental as it can be but at the end of the day I think everyone understands what the goal is uh, and that's to really push narrative and video games forward we pride ourselves on our ability to tell stories um, with video games, and if you go as far back as System Shock 2, I think that's apparent. We can't rest on our laurels. We've done Bioshock Infinite. There's a lot of things we're proud of. There's a lot of things that we could improve on, um, and it's a matter of, of pushing ourselves to take that next evolutionary leap in 
you know, the interactive narrative of video games.